So we've been studying for the last several episodes how to get the electric potential based on a charge density. This problem is governed by Poisson's equation, uh, where this uh, del squared here, the Laplacian, is just two derivatives in the x direction plus two derivatives in the y direction. And this row here is a function of the position that you're looking around, and that's just the charge density. So in regions where you get a maximum in phi, that's where you have positive charge, in regions where you get a minimum in Five is where you have negative charge. Uh, the way we've been able to feed this into our computer is using finite differences. And so the uh, Laplacian of phi gets transformed into this construction where you've taken your phi and you've kind of mapped it onto a grid. So maybe you're looking at a square region. Uh, you move i as the label along the x-axis and j as the label along the y-axis. So this is just counting how many squares you are to the left or right or how many squares you are up or down. And so in order to uh, represent Laplace's equation, uh, we have to have the point to the right, the point to the left, the point above, the point below, and then the point in the middle. And so this is how you represent a uh, second derivative in the uh, finite difference scheme. And then your charge density just becomes a matrix of values. It gets a different value uh, at each coordinate i and j there. And so basically we take this thing, we solve it for i for phi i j, and we're able to get the phi i j through making successively better guesses at what the values are everywhere inside the grid. And the results that we've seen is wherever you have a positive charge, you'll end up with a maximum. Where you have a negative charge, you'll end up with a minimum. That's important for us to know because when you add a charged particle, when you allow a charged particle to move around inside of the electric potential, a positive charge is going to tend to roll down hills. If you put a proton up here, it'll roll, down, roll downhill. If you put a proton up here, it'll roll, roll downhill this way. But how? How does that actually happen physically? Like, this is a nice picture, but how do we know that that actually is what's happening physically? Well, in order to understand that, we have to turn the electric potential into the electric field, right? So the force on each of these protons is going to equal their charge value times the value of the electric field here. Force and electric field are vectors, so they're actually able to move the thing in 3D space. Phi, while it's a scalar and mathematically nice, uh, it just tells us the hilliness. It doesn't actually tell us what direction the force is acting. And so we have to be able to turn the electric potential into the electric field to be able to do any sort of motion analysis of a charged particle. Uh, the way this works is a pretty straightforward mathematical construction. We take the negative gradient of phi. So del here, not del squared anymore, but del the vector. This is the gradient that you're familiar with by now. It's got an x component of a derivative in the x direction and a y component of a derivative in the y direction. And if you wanted to do this in three dimensions, you would just add the same thing z hat d by dz. But we're just going to stick with two dimensions for now just to keep things simple. Uh, so you probably learned in your calculus class that the gradient tells you the direction of maximum slope. It tells you which way is going uphill for a function. Now that this is the negative gradient, this is going to tell you what direction is going downhill. And so the electric field is always going to point downhill. So it's going to point this way. Over here it's going to point this way. Now remember earlier we said that over here there must be a region of positive charge, and over here there must be a region of positive charge, and in this region there must be an area of negative charge, and that basically tells you what you learn in freshman physics, which is that electric fields point from positive charges into negative charges. This business about going uphill versus downhill says the exact same thing, it just says it in terms of a scalar function instead of a vector function. So what we'd like to be able to do with our code, our code does a nice nice job of displaying the electric potential, we would now like our code to be able to display the electric field to show us the electric field vectors coming out of the positive charge and going into the negative charge. And so what we have to do is bring back our, uh, our ij notation with these first derivatives here. So for example, the x component of the electric field is going to be negative d phi dx. Well, we can just replace that 
with a step to the right and a step to the left. So I can have phi going to the right, phi i plus 1j, and I can subtract from that phi to the left, phi i minus 1j. Uh, let's see, my step size there, I'm going, let's, let's say I start out at this point, I need to look at a point to the left and a point to the right, so my total distance there is two steps, right? I take one step and two steps, so this is going to get divided by 2 times dx. Then we can do the same thing with ey. It's going to be negative d phi dy. Again, it's going to be a derivative. This time we're changing y instead of x. And so we need to change the j's instead of the i's. So we'll have phi above, phi i j plus 1, minus phi below, phi i j minus 1. Again, divided by 2 times the step size. And since this is a vector, we have to store these components separately. And so these are going to get stored as an array in Python. So the zeroth element is going to be uh, EX. The, the first element is going to be EY. And so basically all we have to do is take these two things, store them in an array, and we'll have our uh, vector for our electric field, which we can turn into an arrow to display the electric field everywhere. Now here's the good news. The NumPy array already has a great gradient function built in. So we actually don't even have to code this stuff in. We can just use the native gradient function. So our code for this episode starts out exactly the same as it did in the last few episodes because we don't need to change the way we go about getting the electric potential. We first define the charge density function. We're going to start out with a row of zero everywhere, and then we'll change it to something a little more interesting. Uh, we go through our finite differences algorithm to calculate the value of the electric potential at each grid point i comma j. i represents the x coordinate, j represents the y coordinate, and we're just using the same trick that we used before, that each point is going to be equal to the average of the values at the adjacent points, plus this piece that comes from the charge density here. And we keep iterating over that until the thing stops changing, until it levels out to a nice consistent shape. Uh, here is our graph of our current setup based on the uh, boundary conditions. We've got a flat boundary condition here at the south edge, and we've got a parabolic boundary condition here at the north edge. It'll be important to keep in mind those two differences when we see the electric field, because we want to see how does the electric field behave differently near each of these edges. Uh, here's the same thing, but from the other side. So here's where we calculate the electric field. This is the new physics that we're adding to the code today. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to import the gradient function from NumPy. Uh, NumPy, thankfully, has a built-in gradient function that will take a scalar array and turn it into a vector array uh, by applying the derivatives appropriately. We have to specify two things in here. We have to specify the um, electric potential here. So this is this, this data that we have up here, all of these points. You notice we're attaching a negative sign to it because the electric field is the negative gradient of phi. So we're just making sure that negative sign gets included. And then we have to specify the spacing along the grid point. So this is the, uh, near, the, the distance between nearest neighbors in each of these grid points. It just needs this to calculate the uh, numerical derivative by taking the change in phi over the change in x in each of the directions that we need. So that's nice that NumPy has built in that function for us. It produces this uh, construction E field, which has three indices to it. It's got a K, an I, and a J. So you want to think of this as having two lists because this K value here stands for whether you're looking at the X component of the electric field or the Y component of the electric field. So K can be 0 or 1. K equals 0 means we are looking at the X component. K equals 1 means we're looking at the Y component. Uh, remember, we're only looking at the XY plane, so we're not worried about Z components. Nothing's going to be pointing in the Z direction here. And then I and J refer to what they always have. I is our index for X coordinate. J is our index for Y coordinate. So it's a little bit clunky to write, but you just think of K as signifying X or Y component, and then I and J is the location 
along the grid here, just like we had before. So we're really only adding this K to go from a scalar field to a vector field. Um, in order to graph this thing, um, these uh, we're going to draw the electric field at each point along the grid spacing. So we need to draw some arrows. Um, whenever you're working with vector arrows, they can get kind of unruly on the screen if they get too small or too big. So what we're doing here is just scouring all of the elements of the uh, E-field array, and we're trying to see what the maximum electric field magnitude is. So we're just looping over K, looping over I, and looping over J, and we're just searching for the maximum magnitude of the electric field. And since this could be positive or negative, we have to compare the absolute value here uh, for whether it's pointing, you know, left, right, up, or down. It doesn't matter. We want to take the, the, the maximum of all of the absolute values of all of the elements. When we come down here, we'll get to the actual graph. Let me just go ahead and show you what this will look like. So here we've got our uh, our XY plane, and we're just looking overhead at what the electric field vectors look like. Uh, we set the visual scale factors. Um, if you find that your arrows are too short, you can increase this number uh, to make the arrows longer. If your arrows are kind of taking up too much space on the screen and it's hard to tell one apart from the other, you can decrease this number. Um, this scale factor just makes the arrow heads larger or smaller, depending on how visible they end up being. And then this is another important one. This is how many uh, uh, arrows we are skipping over, right? So I'm not showing you every single point in here because otherwise we would be overrun with electric field vectors. So if your graph here gets crowded, just increase this number that will skip over that many uh, uh, arrows in between each point. Or if it's pretty sparse, if you would like to see more arrows, you can decrease this number. Um, here we go through setting up the scale factor and setting up the graphing window. And here we just go through, we loop over the points that we're interested in. You notice we're using this arrow skip to say, I want to go from zero to the final item in the list. And I want you to skip this many arrows. And we're just adding an arrow to the screen at each X coordinate and Y coordinate using the E field value uh, scaled appropriately based on our E scale. Uh, that we get up here. And then we do the same thing over here to get the Y component. So you see here I'm accessing the X component. Here I'm accessing the Y component. And you get this really neat looking display here. Um, what you'll notice is that this is the edge with the flat boundary condition because that's the one that has the corner 10, 10. If I come over here, I see that 10, 10 is in this back corner here with the flat boundary condition. The corner with 0, 0 has the parabolic boundary condition. And what you notice is different is that the flat boundary condition produces a pretty uniform electric field, uh, you know, kind of going along the x-axis here. You notice these are all pointing in the same direction. They've all got the same magnitude. We get a little bit of curvature over here. We call that fringing uh, because we're at the fringe of the of the boundary, and so it's going to kind of leak out a little bit. It's going to behave a little bit differently here. For our parabolic uh, side over here, though, we get this uh, almost radial looking uh, set of electric field vectors where this one's pointing straight out of here, this one points this way, you notice the direction starts to curve a little bit, and that difference propagates forward, right? So this next row here is pretty much the same as this row. It's just that the magnitude is smaller because we're farther away from the fixed electric potential over here. Same thing with this row. Uh, they follow the same pattern in terms of direction, but the magnitude is decreased. By the time we get to the third row from each wall, uh, the magnitude has gotten pretty small, right? Because by that point, the electric potential has gotten pretty flat, right? So by the time you get any appreciable distance away from these edges, uh, things get pretty flat. And remember, the electric field is determined by the hilliness of this thing. Well, by the time you get to flat, that would be zero electric field. And we get pretty close to zero electric field all along the interior here. Um, I do have another option on here for displaying the graph. It's using a, what's called a quiver plot. This is where uh, Matplotlib automatically places arrows for you. It's a really neat view because you can really see how the, uh, the, the magnitude of the electric field changes, but it's really difficult to see where these arrows are pointing. So this is nice for illustrative use, but if you really want to get a view of 
how the electric field is behaving. I think this one's better quantitatively, but this one's really good for showing, uh, you know, where the electric field starts to die off. And of course, we have this uh, amazing fringing effects um, at these corners here. I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in terms of what those are doing, but you can really see the difference here between the parabolic edge and the flat edge, which is pretty cool. So there are actually three more equations involving the electric field that you need to be comfortable working with. One involves the divergence of the electric field, one involves the curl of the electric field, and one involves the flux of the electric field. Let's take a look at each of them in turn. So when you have the divergence of the electric field, what you're doing is you're saying you're going to take x hat d by dx plus y hat d by dy, uh, and yeah, we actually do need this to be in 3D, plus z hat d by dz, dotted with your electric field, right? This is going to be ex x hat plus ey y hat plus ez z hat. And you look at that, you have a thing with three terms times a thing with three terms in principle that gives you nine terms, yikes. But the good news is because this is the dot product, any terms that don't match in terms of the components are going to go away. So for example, x hat dotted with y hat always gives you zero. You don't even have to worry about that. Z hat dotted with y hat going to give you zero every time. It doesn't matter what the components are. And so what you end up with for this thing is just d by dx of ex plus d by dy of ey plus d by dz of ez. That works out pretty well. Um, we are working in two dimensions, so our EZ is automatically zero, so we're just going to erase that for now and worry about it later. Um, and so what we can do in order to work this out in the code so that we can check this equation, we can just use the same kind of uh, uh, translation process that we've done before, right? So DEX DX, that first derivative, is going to be EX at I plus 1 J minus ex at i minus 1j, going to divide by 2 times dx, plus do the same thing in the y direction, maybe we change the j's instead of the i's, so we'll have an ex uh, ij plus 1 minus ex ij minus 1, all divided by 2 dx. So uh, we will have to code this in because NumPy does not have a native divergence function. If you know of a native divergence function in Python, let me know. I'll gladly make a replacement in the code. Uh, but this is what we can plug in. Uh, this is pretty straightforward to code. Uh, you know, we are just looking at changing the i component, then we're just looking at changing the j component there. Now with the curl, it gets a little bit more interesting because you have this same thing x hat d v x plus y hat d d y plus z hat d d z crossed with, the difference is instead of dotting it, you're crossing it, e x x hat plus e y y hat plus e z z hat. And so you still get some zeros, right, because x hat cross x, x hat gives you zero, but it doesn't end up being quite as nice. You end up with more terms than this. Uh, the good news, again, is that we have no z component to our uh, electric fields. We can actually get rid of that part there. Um, what you're going to end up with this thing is that you're going to have a dey by dx plus a de, oh no, excuse me, a minus. Right, cross product turns things negative, a dex by dy. I will let you figure out how you set that one up in Python. The flux part we'll come back to in the future when we're ready to work in 3D. This is not going to work out all right in 2D. So what we'll take a look at the next part of the video is how we set up this divergence. Now we can confirm that this equation works, and then I'll leave it up to you to figure out how to encode the curl here. It should just be a nice, simple modification of the divergence and confirm that you always get zero for the curl of the electric field. Now, of course, we want to be able to check this to make sure that, uh, you know, all this gradient math is being done appropriately. The way we can do that is by calculating the divergence of the electric field. This is supposed to give us back the charge density. But one of Maxwell's equations states that if you take the divergence of the electric field, that's where you take the gradient operator, del here, and you take its dot product with E, you should get out the charge density rho divided by epsilon naught. Epsilon naught is one in our case, 
and rho in our case is zero. So for this case, we should get back zero everywhere. It should be flat. This is gonna return a scalar field since this is a dot product. Um, and so this doesn't have any vector associated with it. It's just a scalar field. It's got a scalar value at each point ij in the grid. Unfortunately, uh, NumPy does not have a built-in divergence function, so I've had to do that manually here. So we start with a with an array called divergence. Uh, we're just going to initialize it to zero everywhere. And since I need to have a, a value everywhere on the grid here, this is going to have dimensions of our grid, right? So the length of x list and the length of y list, the number of grid points that we have in two dimensions. What we're going to do is loop over every point in that list, well, every point on the interior, right? I can't go to the leftmost edge because I don't have a spot to go past that. Um, but what we do is we look for the change in the electric field across that point. So if I wanna get the change in the electric field's X component, I need to go one point to the right and one point to the left. So I'm taking the difference between those two points. And I know I'm working with the X component because my K value is zero. And you notice that my J value stays the same because I'm only looking at changes in the X direction. For the Y component, I'm only looking at changes in the Y direction. So I have J changing. I go to one point north of the point that I'm looking at and one point south of the point that I'm looking at. Keep X the same. So keep that the same. And I only look at the y component because in the divergence, you're taking the derivative with respect to x of the x component and you're taking the derivative with respect to y of the y component. So that's where uh, the divergence is a very nice operator to work with because you only take a couple of derivatives. And so to formulate the divergence, I have to add those together. So I take the differential of the x component and the differential of the y component, add those together. In order to turn that into an actual slope, I have to divide that by the change in x, which is going to be 2 times dx. The 2 there is because I'm going across two points, right? I'm going from a point to the, uh, to the left to a point to the right. I'm going from a point below to a point above. So I'm moving two grid units. So that's why the 2 is there. And that's going to be the divergence at points i, j, right? At, at x coordinate i and y coordinate j. So this is a scalar field. We know how to plot that by now. We just do the same thing we did for plotting the uh, electric potential. And we should get zero everywhere. And we pretty much do. We get a little bit of noise here at the edges uh, just because you know that's where the, the method is going to be least accurate. But you can see here it's pretty flat, right? So we're getting out zero everywhere just like we expect. So that's a nice little check on our uh, electric field code here. Let's play around with this a little bit. Let's see what happens when we start to change the charge density. So let's suppose we made a charge density. Let's use another Gaussian like we did before. So we'll say exponential of negative x squared plus y squared. And I need to get parentheses around those folks. There we go. So this is going to uh, die off exponentially as we get farther away from the origin. And let's make our uh, let's make our boundary conditions more uniform. Uh, so we'll just make these a small number. So say 0 0.1 all around the board. 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, and 0 0.1. And we'll want to turn off the uh, I want to turn off the parabolic boundary condition here. So I'll just do Control Slash to comment that out. And let's also change our, let's make this symmetric about the origin. So we'll go from negative five to five, just since I've, since I've centered the Gaussian in the uh, center of the grid there. All right, and there's our electric potential, just like we've seen before. Um, I'll go ahead and run this one just so that our graphs are consistent. All right, here we go. We're going to calculate the electric field. Uh, that's a much quicker process because it's just taking all that information and, uh, you know, representing it as a vector. All right, here comes the electric field for our Gaussian. Wow! Oh my goodness, it looks like a it looks like a movie theater promo or something. Okay, yeah, we're gonna need to. This is an example of where you need to uh, uh, decrease the uh, arrow length scale factor because those arrows are way too long. Let's try decreasing that by a factor of 10. 
there's another advantage of having all these cells broken up in uh, in Jupyter is because then I don't have to rerun the entire code. I just rerun the part that's doing the graphing. Cool. So, uh, you know, you, what you would expect, there's a stronger electric field closer to the, where there's more charge. The electric field gets weaker as we get away from that big blob of charge in the center. Uh, I wonder what happens with our quiver plot here. Oh, that's really groovy. That's really groovy. I don't know what the options are on this for adjusting, but that, I mean, that's a really cool picture of what the electric field is doing. Uh, then down here, we'll calculate the divergence. We should get a Gaussian back. And lo and behold, that's what we get. We get a nice Gaussian curve there centered around zero, zero. <clears throat> What's another one we could try? Why don't we just try a, uh, what's another one we could try? Why don't we try a dipole like we've done before? How did I, shoot. All right, Brian, hold on one second. Why don't we try a Gaussian like we've done before? How did I do a Gaussian last time? Uh, we set, oh yeah, we set up this whole charges function thing. Um, yeah, so let's grab this. We're gonna grab this cell here. We'll uh, import it in here, copy paste. Cool. And let's put our charges Let's just do a dipole for now. So we'll do uh, one, two, uh, comment out those cues. We'll do one at one, one, and, or one, zero, and negative one, zero. Yeah, that'll be fine. Um, and then what I can do is come back up here and reproduce the point charge uh, row here. So we got delta function width row equals zero, et cetera. And whenever you don't want this, whenever you want the function instead, just comment this part out, paste. All right, that should work out fine. And we'll come down here, we'll run this. It has told me that it has finished. And now we'll run this one. Oh, I forgot to make one of those negatives. So we have two positive charges. Oh, well, we'll run with it. Uh, let's see, we'll get our, uh, our, our re-angled graph here for the uh, for the for the potential difference, let's get our electric field. Good, good. We get our electric field here. What does it end up looking like? Okay, so we get a so electric fields come out of positive. So we have one source somewhere over here. We got things coming out of the positive here and things coming out of the positive here. You know what? I did actually want a negative on one of those. Let's make uh, where does it go? Oh yeah, let's so the charge is the first one, so I'll make this one here a negative. Run that, run this. There we go, there's a proper dipole with a positive charge and a negative charge. Uh, let's come down here, let's get our electric field calculated and graphed. There we go, that's a lot easier to tell that you've got one charge where there is electric field coming out and one charge where the electric field is going in and they swirl out from one to the other. We can make that, uh, we can make that scale factor a little bit longer. How about a 20? Yeah, there we go. It works out okay because, you know, sometimes they straddle across a point like this and it's a little bit difficult to tell, but uh, it's, it's fun to work with. All right, let's check out the quiver plot for this one. Oh, goodness, that is a mess. Yeah, we'll have to learn what the options are for this thing to get that to, to be a little bit more visible. Okay, let's do the check of the divergence now. Make sure we get back our charge density, and we certainly do. We've got a delta function spiking up here and a delta function spiking down here, which is exactly what we expected. So this is a lot of fun that you can play around with. Again, you can make any shape that you can imagine either using rho as a function or using a series of point charges. And this worksheet here will get out for you the electric field vectors.